With the release of Kendrick Lamar's newest album, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, one of the biggest questions that everybody's wondering about is why is Kodak Black on this album so much? Um, I've been wondering about this all day, and I've been really thinking over it, and I, I don't know. I can't fathom it. The album handles sexual assault and abuse so well, but to include someone who's guilty of that very thing just seems so hypocritical, and it's really upsetting to try and think about it and understand it, so, um, yeah, let's talk about it. Alright, so first for some context on Kodak Black. So I'm getting this from a Complex.com article on the whole trial process for him. So it says, Kodak Black was accused of assaulting and raping a female victim in South Carolina. The alleged assault took place in February 2016 following Kodak's performance at Treasure City Club in Florence, South Carolina. The victim said she attended the concert at Treasure City where she met Kodak Black and later accompanied the rapper to his hotel room at a Comfort Inn and Suites. According to police reports, she said he bit her repeatedly and raped her as she screamed for help. The victim, who was reportedly a high school student at the time, told her school nurse who alerted the Florence County Sheriff's Office. As part of a plea deal, he pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of first-degree assault and battery. According to Kodak Black's attorney, he had romantic ideas on his mind. She did not, so he ended up trying to have a romantic encounter with her and bit her as part of that and injured her. When asked by the judge if the facts stated by his attorney were true, he said, yes, sir. Kodak Black also apologized to the victim, saying, I am hopeful we can all move forward. I wish her the best in her life. The public apology was a term of his plea deal. Kodak was originally facing up to 30 years behind bars, but due to his lower plea deal, he will no longer face jail time. He got a 10-year suspended sentence and 18 months probation with the condition that he takes full accountability for his actions and publicly apologizes, which he complied with in court. He has also been ordered to undergo further counseling. In regard to his previous legal issues, Kodak was also able to avoid prison time. In January 2021, he was granted clemency by Donald Trump. At the time, he was serving a 46-month sentence for falsifying information on federal forms to buy firearms from a South Florida gun shop. The White House cited Kodak's philanthropic efforts, such as his educational and charity events for children and underprivileged families, as well as his ties to religious leaders as reasons for his commutation. Following the news, Kodak thanked the former president on Twitter, writing, I want to thank the president, at real Donald Trump, for his commitment to justice reform and shortening my sentence. I also want to thank everyone for their support and love. It means more than you will ever know. I want to continue giving back, learning, and growing. Also, Kodak's attorney in a statement to uh, XXL explained the rapper's resolution in the case. Quote, Today, Bill Capri took a plea to the legal charge of assault, a non-sex offense, and received 18 months probation. This was a change of charge from the original charge. Having consistently denied these five-year-old allegations, he entered this plea in order to resolve the matter. After he was given the 10-year suspended sentence and put on 18 months of probation, Kodak Black quickly took to social media, tweeting a single grinning emoji wearing sunglasses. He tweeted again minutes later, saying he and the victim just wanted to get this stuff over with, and adding, I ain't have to come off no money. He also said his heart goes out to all the girls out here getting raped and stuff, for real, but I ain't did that. So although Kodak Black was technically not found guilty on the rape charges, it seems pretty clear to me that he was guilty. I mean, the story is that he admits that him and the victim met up after the concert he admits to assaulting her just um still denies raping her and then after that the girl goes to the school nurse the trial process happens after a long and lengthy trial process of denying everything then all of a sudden when there's um an opportunity for a plea deal to get off easier then he finally admits to assaulting her with a lot of the details still staying the same, such as the biting thing, just technically um, still denying that it was rape. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But even if you don't believe that he did rape her, at the very least he did admit to assaulting her. So on top of that, there are plenty of other charges on him. He has various drug possession car charges, uh, gun possession charges. In April 2017, he was accused of punching and kicking a woman at the Miami-Dade strip club uh, where she was employed. He was also criticized for crude comments towards the late Nipsey Hussle's girlfriend recently after his passing. 
and he was also criticized for his obscene um, or just for his plain disrespectful comments about dark-skinned black women. So there's a Twitter thread that I found that I think is very well said and captures basically all of my feelings about um, Kodak being on the album. So I think it's important for you to hear it all, so I'll read the entire thread. Uh, so it starts, thread. I think that we've entered this annoying trend of conscious rappers or artists thinking they are doing something enlightening and or edgy by attempting to redeem and or reimagine problematic slash toxic individuals in society. Kendrick Lamar sadly chose Kodak Black on purpose. The betrayal stings because these artists think they are giving these trash individuals grace in a way that society isn't, but they are actually perpetrating a violent cycle of divorcing them of true accountability. Why must black women and others be denied justice? The annoying part is that artists that know better should do better, but somehow they get passes in the name of being human. Somehow being human keeps looking like collaborating with abusers and rapists, but never seeing solidarity with their victims. The hypocrisy. There's nothing noble, complex, or nuanced about Kendrick Lamar giving Kodak Black another check, platform, and audience at a time when he continues to be embroiled in so much controversy. Dude took a plea deal after being accused of raping a girl when she was in high school. I see stuff like this and I'm like, where's the bold defense of men in hip-hop for black women and others at the mainstream level? It's so easy to act like the world is so hard on these toxic rappers, but in reality they are still touring and making millions. Why does Shock Factor and Hip Hop translate to a collaboration with an abuser? Do you know how bold it would be to actually name that stuff and push through? Kodak Black was on Future's album last week. Kendrick isn't doing anything special putting him on this. So many of the themes of Mr. Morale the Big Steppers is rooted in confronting trauma around sexual abuse and or the presumption of such. The fact that Kendrick Lamar would include Kodak Black on that album is a contraction that sours a lot of focus away from that exploration. We are listening to music a lot differently than we were when Kendrick Lamar dropped dang, in early 2017. That was before the Me Too movement took off. Five years later, you're going to hear a lot more from fans about having abusers and alleged rapists in your music. It matters. Drake's certified lover boy was tainted by the inclusion of that R. Kelly sample. The fact that so many of us called it out that the producer had to explain its origins says a lot about how we demand accountability in music in ways we collectively weren't pre-2017. Also, Drake is like a huge pedophile as well, but that's, that's a different video. Um, anyways, the way Kodak Black was trending last night for all the wrong reasons connected to Kendrick's album was the same way I remember R. Kelly trending that night when Drake's album dropped. We want answers, and just because we stand for you, we're still gonna call it out. At age 30, I personally think it's getting sad that some of the artists I grew up listening to aren't growing up with me. My best friend and I were talking about this last week. Some of these individuals seem to be stuck in a comfort zone that's unrelatable to the rest of us. Like the things I culturally accepted in music 10 years ago aren't the things I want to rock with today. I feel like some artists grow with their fans. They meet us where we are as a society, and others forcefully remain in their sunken place, driven by money. At a time when the culture is calling for more elevation of women in hip-hop, it's jarring that Kendrick Lamar still hasn't put a prominent female rapper on his album. It's frustrating that Kodak Black continues to get more redemption and opportunity in the same industry and yeah i really have nothing else to add to that it was really well said and it encapsulates everything that i'm thinking and feeling and so um now i'll take all the themes from the latter half of that thread and focus them onto another situation so that you can understand the issue more deeply and so this is pretty much exactly the same as during the donda rollout when Ye had a bunch of performers come out um, during I think the third concert listening party and two of the performers were DaBaby and Marilyn Manson um, And this was very controversial since DaBaby had recently been under a lot of fire for his homophobic comments about HIV AIDS and Marilyn Manson a number of women had recently come out talking about their experience being sexually abused by him so it got a lot of controversy and most people just assumed that it was another one of Ye's um, attempts to draw controversy in the news to get his name circulating like a publicity stunt. But I found an article where one of the Donna producers, Digital Nas, gives his perspective on why he thinks that Ye is still associating with them and did at the time. Uh, so it reads, 
Originally, West's allegiance with Warner seemed like an extension of his edgelord behavior, such as claiming slavery sounds like a choice and the rapper's support for Donald Trump. But Digital Nas speculates another reason West has embraced Warner, Christian sympathy. Quote, I think it's more so that Ye is coming from a standpoint of like, we all make mistakes, he says. I think that's maybe why he had to baby in Maryland at that one show. I'm just assuming it is from a standpoint of like, we're all sinners, we all make mistakes, we shouldn't point the finger at someone for the mistakes they've made or something like that. And so I think this is a re very revealing point that almost certainly applies to Kendrick as well, since um, a lot of the main themes of the album on Mr. Morale are about redemption and like looking into your trauma um, and then why that causes you to do the bad things that you do later on, but then also like owning up and taking accountability for those actions. Like for example, on one of the main things where Kendrick, he admits to infidelity with his fiance, um, like he looks into the psychology of what was driving that, but then also how that was harmful to him and most importantly her, and then also taking accountability for it. Um, which again, just makes no sense why Kodak is on the album if he did not do that in any way. But um, the kind of mindset of, oh, we're all sinners, we all make mistakes, we shouldn't point the finger at someone for the mistakes they've made. It's like, it's such a dangerous mindset for Christians and just people in general because it sounds so close to the core attribute of Christianity, which is forgiveness being possible for everyone. But it is actually contrary to what the Bible teaches and it ends up harming everybody involved in a situation rather than helping anybody. And so um, now I'll read an article um, that I found which talks about the concept of forgiveness in the Bible and kind of like how it is most likely different than what you imagine. And so I think like after this you'll see and I kind of like was able to see what I think Kendrick's mindset was in including Kodak. Since his Christian faith he's so public about it and it's such a integral part of this album. So it says, the Bible speaks a great deal about forgiveness, both God's forgiveness of sinful human beings and the forgiveness that human beings should have for each other. But they are not two separate, unrelated issues of forgiveness. Rather, they are vitally linked. Intimacy with God and day-to-day -day cleansing are dependent on our forgiveness of others. And our forgiveness of others is to be patterned on and an example of God's forgiveness of us. Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13. So this question is an important one. Uh, the question is, since God withholds forgiveness, can we? We need to make an effort to understand God's forgiveness of us if we are going to forgive others in a way that reflects God's forgiveness. Sadly, in recent decades, the word forgiveness has taken on a connotation of quote-unquote psychological freedom instead of freedom from sin, and this has brought some confusion about the whole concept of what it means to forgive. It is true that the forgiveness God extends to us is conditional upon our confession of sin and repentance. Confession involves agreeing with God about our sin, and repentance requires a change of mind concerning the wrong attitude or action, and a change in behavior that evinces a genuine willingness to forsake the sin. Sin remains unforgiven unless it is confessed and repented of. While this might seem a difficult condition for forgiveness, it is also a great blessing and promise. Confession of sin is not an act of self-condemnation, but of seeking God's provision of the remedy for sin and forgiveness through Christ. God's requirement that we must confess and repent of sin does not mean God is unwilling or unready to forgive. He has done everything on his part to facilitate forgiveness for us. His heart is willing, not wanting anyone to perish. And he has gone to the most extreme lengths imaginable to provide the means by which he, he can forgive us. Because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, God freely offers us that forgiveness. Scripture says to forgive others as we have been forgiven and love one another as we are loved. We should be willing to and ready to extend forgiveness to anyone who comes to us, confessing his sin and repenting. Not only is this an obligation, but it should be our delight. If we are truly thankful for our own forgiveness, we should have no hesitancy in granting forgiveness to a repentant offender, even if he wrongs us and repents again and again. After all, we too sin again and again, and we are thankful that God forgives us when we come to him with a true repentant heart of confession. That brings us to the question at hand. Should we forgive a person who does not confess his sin and is not repentant? To answer this properly, the term forgiveness needs some explaining. First, what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not the same as forbearance. To forbear is to patiently endure 
a provocation, overlook a slight, or maintain self-control in the face of frustration. Forbearance causes us to weigh someone's sinful action or attitude with love, wisdom, and discernment, and choose not to respond. Scripture uses various words for this quality, patience, long-suffering, endurance, and, of course, forbearance. Forgiveness is also not forgetting. God does not suffer from amnesia about our sin. He remembers very clearly. However, it is not a remembering to condemn us. King David's adultery and Abraham's lying. These sins are recorded for all time in scripture. God obviously did not forget about them. Forgiveness is not an elimination of all consequences. Even when we are forgiven by Christ, we may still suffer the natural consequences of our sin or face the discipline of a loving Heavenly Father. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It is a commitment to pardon the offender. Feelings may or may not accompany forgiveness. Feelings of bitterness against a person may fade with time without any forgiveness being extended. Forgiveness is not the private solitary act of an individual heart. In other words, forgiveness involves at least two people. This is where confession and repentance come in. Forgiveness is not only what happens within the offended person's heart. It is a transaction between two people. Forgiveness is not selfish. It is not motivated by self-interest. We do not seek to forgive for our own sakes or to relieve ourselves from stress. We forgive out of love of God, love of neighbors, and gratefulness for our own forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the automatic restoration of trust. It is wrong to think that forgiving an abusive spouse today means the separation should end tomorrow. Scripture gives us many reasons to distrust those who have proved themselves untrustworthy. Rebuilding trust can only begin after a process of reconciliation involving true forgiveness, which of course involves confession and repentance. Also, importantly, forgiveness offered and available is not the same as forgiveness given, received, and transacted. This is where the word forgiveness on its own with no qualifier is often used differently from and beyond how God's words uses it. We tend to call the attitude of forgiveness, uh, that is being willing to forgive, forgiveness, just the same as the actual transaction of true forgiveness. That is, in popular thinking, as long as a person is open to granting forgiveness, he is already forgiven. But this broad definition of forgiveness short circuits the process of confession and repentance. Forgiveness offered and forgiveness received are entirely different and we don't help ourselves by using a catch-all word for both. If this is what forgiveness is not, then what is it? An excellent definition of forgiveness is found in the book Unpacking Forgiveness by Chris Bronze. God's forgiveness is a commitment by the one true God to pardon graciously those who repent and believe so that they are reconciled to him. Although this commitment does not eliminate all consequences, and general human forgiveness is a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person, although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. Biblically, full forgiveness is not just something that the offended person offers, it requires that the offender receives it, bringing reconciliation to the relationship. 1 John 1 9 shows that the process of forgiveness is primarily to free the sinner. Forgiveness ends the rejection, thus reconciling the relationship. This is why we must be willing to forgive others. If we aren't willing to forgive, we refuse to allow others to enjoy what God has blessed us with. Modern pop psychology has wrongly taught that forgiveness is one-sided, that reconciliation is unnecessary, and that the purpose of this unilateral forgiveness is to free the offended person of feelings of bitterness. While we must not harbor bitterness in our hearts or repay evil for evil, we should make sure we follow God's lead and not extend forgiveness to the unrepentant. In short, we should withhold forgiveness from those who do not confess and repent. At the same time, we should extend the offer of forgiveness and maintain an attitude of readiness to forgive. Stephen, as he was being stoned to death, illustrates the principle of forgiveness, echoing Jesus' words from the cross. Stephen prays, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. These words show a definite willingness to forgive, but they do not indicate a completed transaction of forgiveness. Stephen simply prayed that God would forgive his murderers. Stephen held no bitterness, and when and if his murderers repented, he wished them to be forgiven. What a wonderful example of loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. The Bible commands the counterintuitive action of feeding our enemy when he is hungry. There is nothing to say we must automatically forgive our enemies or trust them. Rather, we are to love them and work for their good. If forgiveness is given prematurely without the prerequisites of confession and repentance, then the truth has not been dealt with openly by both parties. If the offender doesn't acknowledge his sin, then he really does not understand what it means to be forgiven. In the long run, bypassing confession or repentance doesn't help the offender to understand the significance of sin, and it precludes a sense of justice, causing the offended person to battle even more against bitterness. Here are some key guidelines for godly forgiveness. 
You acknowledge the fact of evil. Leave vengeance to the Lord. Leave no room for bitterness, revenge, grudges, or retaliation. Have a heart ready to forgive at a moment's notice. Trust God to give you the ability to overcome evil with good, even to love and feed an enemy. Remember that God has instituted governing authorities. And part of their God-given role is to be God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. One reason you don't have to avenge yourself is that God has authorized government to provide justice. And so now after hearing that whole article, I think I can juxtapose within Mr. Morale an example of good forgiveness versus bad forgiveness. So the right example of forgiveness is with Kendrick and Whitney. If we go back to the definition of general human forgiveness from the article, which is a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person, although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. Kendrick has done wrong by cheating on Whitney and has fallen victim to sin and temptation. He has recognized his wrong with her, but has still hurt her. The consequences of his cheating have damaged the relationship permanently, but Whitney has chosen to forgive him and has chosen to reconcile the relationship even still. And so the two of them are now reconciled, and even though the consequences of Kendrick's cheating are not going to go away, she chooses to give him the chance to move forward from his actions a changed man. So now, the example of incorrect forgiveness is with Kodak Black. So if I go to another little snippet from the article which says, If forgiveness is given prematurely, without the prerequisites of confession and repentance, then the truth has not been dealt with openly by both parties. Kodak has not confessed, but rather took a plea deal for a lesser charge. He has not repented, as shown by his careless attitude immediately after the trial, and has not reconciled with the victim. And it says if the offender doesn't acknowledge his sin, then he really does not understand what it means to be forgiven. In the long run, bypassing confession or repentance doesn't help the offender to understand the significance of sin, and it precludes a sense of justice causing the offended person to battle even more against bitterness. So the victim is battling even more against bitterness, and Kodak has not seen any consequences, so he does not understand the consequences of forgiveness like he does not understand what it means to be forgiven of his wrongs because he does not even acknowledge his wrongs and he has not faced any consequences for them basically all that has happened is that he got off uh, scot-free and didn't have to face the consequences for what he did and then now Kendrick puts him on the album and the vast majority of people are gonna see this and just go oh Kendrick put a rapist on his album and that's really all that Kodak's inclusion has accomplished. And so how then do we properly deal with these kinds of people look like Kodak Black? And I think that what J. Cole said is really respectable and really lines up with what the Bible says. So this is an article from vibe.com. It says, in the past, J. Cole has been heavily criticized for his support of XXX Temptation, Kodak Black, and other artists accused of abuse. While Cole has never condoned their specific actions, his outward support on social media has rubbed many fans the wrong way. But according to Cole, everyone, even those accused of the most awful offenses, deserves some sort of healing. The middle child artist addressed the backlash concerning his previous cosigns of Kodak, XXX, and Takashi69 in the April 2019 cover story for XXL. Cole sparked outrage after he made a series of statements praising their musical skills or encouraging others to pray for them during tough times. I get it. There's some people out there that do things that a person can't fathom loving anybody that can do that, he admitted. But nobody becomes that way overnight. Nobody is born that way. That stuff is a product of unfortunate circumstances and mishaps in the person's life. Too many to count. Stuff that they may not even remember that, in my opinion, causes someone to be as sick as they would be to be an effing murderer, to be dumb enough just to take a life. He continued, I know many murderers, I still speak to them. These dudes have committed the ultimate crime in God's eyes or whatever, where they've taken a life. These people I still speak to, love and have compassion for. I see how in their life that happened, how you became a murderer. Maybe some of them don't even know, don't have even have a chance to process why they become the monsters that they are. Cole also explained how he would have confronted XXX Temptation about those abuse allegations. Prior to X's death in June 2018, the rapper was accused of beating and sexually assaulting his then pregnant girlfriend. Cole previously tweeted about how quote-unquote talented he thought X was. While he wasn't aware of the allegations at the time, he said if the late rapper was here today, he wouldn't turn his back on him. Quote, even if I initially knew what XXXTentation did, I wouldn't have cut him off. 
like, hey man, why are you putting your hands on women? Or why the F did you do these sick things to this girl? He explained, I would have asked a series of questions that hopefully would have sparked something in his mind. It would have been toward the direction of healing. It wouldn't have been in the direction of punishment, judgment, cancellation, because he deserves healing. Especially the girl that he did all that stuff to. She absolutely needs healing. It's like, I'm just going to discard you and throw you in the trash and forget about you. That's what they're doing in the prison system. That's what we're actually fighting to stop. We're trying to fight the fact that prisons offer no rehabilitation and that people come out even worse than they went in. And so I think that this is exactly the right response. I'll read a snippet from the article again. It says, The Bible commands the counterintuitive action of feeding our enemy while he is hungry. Romans 12.20 There's nothing to say we must automatically forgive our enemies or trust them. Rather, we are to love them and work for their good. So while we should never condone the actions of celebrities or people we know or anything, or forgive them if they're unrepentant, or even associate with them if it's a danger to you, the Bible still commands you to love them and to work for their good and for their healing. I think that this has been a big part of Kendrick's music so far. Like, for example, from the song Mad City, some of the lyrics say, If I told you I killed a man at 16, would you believe me? Or see me to be innocent Kendrick you seen in the street, with a basketball and some now and later to eat. If I mentioned all of my skeletons, would you jump in the seat? This encapsulates what I was saying about how people that have been raised up in a harmful environment that has shaped them into a dangerous person should still have an opportuni opportunity to change for the better, and you should still forgive them if you are repentant. But the whole point of this video is that while we should love our enemies and work towards their good, and forgive people who are repentant, we need to be very careful in the way in which we're showing them grace and are working for their good. Like for example, Kendrick including Kodak Black, even if he did have the intention, which I hope that he did, of sort of trying to show him grace that society hasn't given him, and to give him an opportunity to change, that's ultimately harmful to him, uh, to the victim, and to the industry as a whole. And so that is not the right action according to scripture, including Kodak Black, because it's not ultimately working for your enemy's good, even though it really seems like it is. Um, so yeah, I guess that's all I have to say for the video. Overall, I feel very betrayed and hurt that Kendrick would include Kodak on the album. Uh, I saw another tweet like expressing this sentiment that said they were just accepting that some artists they don't connect with anymore or resonate anymore with anymore, and that is really kind of what I'm feeling. Um, Mr. Morale, the album, even though a lot of it is very strong with the themes that it touches upon um, and very insightful, Kodak's inclusion just kind of kills the entire thing for me um, and makes it uh, makes me have a bit of a weird relationship with Kendrick's music as a whole. Um, I still am going to listen to his older stuff because I still respect it, but um, it's just kind of weird. Uh, so I hope that Kendrick speaks out speaks out on this with the controversy and everything. I know that he's notoriously closed off, but at least now that the album is out, I hope that there's a chance for him to respond. But yeah, I hope that you learned something from this video or it made you think or anything. If you have any thoughts about it at all, let me know in the comments. I'll read them all and respond. And um, be sure to follow me for more video essays like this if you like my thoughts or anything. Um, I'm going to try and do more of these now that summer has started and try to grow this channel. But uh, yeah, anyways, I hope that you have a good day, and thank you so much for watching.